you in a powerful way, a way that you hear, a way that you can understand. And then at the end of the service, at the end of this message, we're going to get a chance to respond to what he's saying. So I pray that through this service you listen to God to hear his word to you. Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles and our Bible apps to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Now the Bible's separated into two parts. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Luke is one of the first books in the New Testament. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four Gospels. They're the stories about Jesus. That's where you see it the most is in those four Gospels. Now, if you're not sure how to find those, you can use your table of contents. That's what I do when I, when I get lost. Or you can use the, the Bible, uh, the paperback Bible underneath the seat. Uh, we're, in page, we're on page 591 in that Bible. But check it out. Luke, I said, is one of the four Gospels. It's actually the longest book in the New Testament. And it is part one of, of two-part series. You have Luke, and then it's continued in Acts. Um, and so... We don't really know who the author is because, let me back up, the author is not mentioned in there, but we do know who he is. It was Luke, the doctor. He traveled with Paul, uh, mentioned later in Acts. Um, So we know that Luke wrote specifically to the Greeks. The reason for his book was to help the Greeks understand who Jesus is. So let's jump in. We're going to read Luke 10, starting in verse 25. And as we read, I want you to take whatever posture God leads you to. Stand, sit, kneel while we read God's word. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked. This is Jesus speaking. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? (laughs) Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. The priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers, Jesus asked. The one who showed him mercy, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the knowledge that is so rich in this. And we ask, God, that with our finite minds that we can help, that you will help us to understand what you mean. Holy Spirit, work through these words. Help us to grasp the meaning. And God, I pray that you will move aside any any preconceptions that we come to the table with today. Help us to see your word for what you meant it to be, not what we want it to be, not what someone else has taught us. And God, I pray for me, I pray right now that the words that I speak are your words. I pray the thoughts that form in my head are your thoughts. God, help me to only present your message to this church. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me start off this way. Some of you have probably heard this passage and this story of the Good Samaritan before. Now, I know for me, it's natural to approach Bible passages that I've heard with a familiarity. And sometimes that can limit my learning. So my request is that today, let's approach this one with an open mind. Let's approach it with a fresh eyes so that we can hear what God says today. Let's look it back up. We're going to pick it apart. Let's look at verse 25 and 26. It says, Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked. How do you read it? So, Check it out. Here's where Jesus is. Jesus is in a 
teaching forum, much like this one, probably smaller, probably different, maybe around, it could be completely different, but the people learning were sitting, and Jesus, as a teacher, was standing. That's how they went about their teaching. So when this expert in the law stood up, he put himself on the equal playing field with Jesus. Now, it's important to point out that this guy, he was not trying to back Jesus Jesus into a corner. He wasn't trying to prove that he wasn't the Messiah. Now, I've heard that before, but the text doesn't show that. What he's doing is he's testing Jesus' ability to teach. He's saying, does this guy, does he know the law? Can he answer these questions adequately? Does he know the word? Now, he was asking, is there a specific act? Is there a single deed that can be done to be saved? And Jesus answers, well, what does the law say? In other words, what has God already told us about this? And how do you interpret it? I love that. Jesus knows that people, then and now, that we interpret Scripture differently. We come from different walks of life, different backgrounds. We're taught by different people. We interpret it differently. But Jesus, so Jesus says, what do you think? How do you read it? Jesus, he probably knew that this guy had his own agenda. And this was his way of trying to draw out and understand what that agenda was. Let's look at 27 and 28. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. So the man quotes two verses from the Torah or the Pentateuch. They're the same thing. It's the first five books of the New Testament that were written by Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And Jesus knew that any religious person of that day, a religious leader, would have had these memorized, the Torah. Now, any of you guys going through uh, Marvin's class on Wednesday night, you know how difficult it would be to memorize uh, the first few books that you've gone through. It's not an easy task. So these guys had it committed to memory. Jesus knew this. So what he does, the man, he, he takes out two verses from the Old Testament. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, 18. And when he does it, Jesus says, hey, you're right. You got it right. That's exactly what you need to do. I love how Jesus, he answers a New Testament question with Old Testament passages. He allows the Old Testament to speak for itself. And get this, Jesus doesn't add to it. He doesn't change it. He doesn't say, that's right, but there's a little bit more to it. What he does is he clarifies it. He puts it into context for the people around him so that they could understand what it meant. I like how how Augustine says it. He says, the gospel is concealed in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. If you've read through the whole word of God, you know that the gospel is all the way through it. It doesn't start in Matthew all of a sudden. It's all the way through it. And another thing interesting is the demand. He asked the question, that he already kind of knew the answer to. These people already knew how to be saved before Jesus came along. It's, it's a little bit different now, but, but they realized what it was, and now they're going to get to see how Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies. Now, Jesus had, if Jesus had just affirmed what the man thought, then it would be over, right? If he said, hey, That's right. That's what it is. And the guy's like, yeah, cool. All right. You're with me. He would move along. But that's not what happens. Check out verse 29. He says, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The man shows that he either doesn't fully agree with what Jesus is saying or that he wants clarification to make sure Jesus meant meant it how he believed it. Check this out. For for Jewish society, neighbor meant fellow Israelite and no one else. Neighbor meant the people just like me. Both Jesus and this expert of the law knew this. But the expert 
he was hoping that Jesus meant it the same way so he didn't have to change. He, he, he could see there was a hint of something else in there. That's why he asked. But he was really hoping maybe Jesus means it the same way I do. And Jesus, in continuing in, in the story he tells, he shows that he does not mean it the same way. And, and note this. I'm getting ahead of myself, but check this out. Jesus doesn't answer his question. The guy says, well, who's my neighbor? Jesus doesn't answer it. He makes the expert answer his own question after the story. So let's jump into the story, starting in verse 30. Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. So here are some interesting facts for you, okay? Jerusalem is 2,600 feet above sea level. 2,600 feet above sea level. Jericho is 825 feet below sea level. It was a 17 or 18 mile journey to get from Jerusalem down to Jericho. So anyone traveling it would be going down. And this path was a long and winding path. Many places were steep, had rugged, hilly country. There were caves there. So plenty of room for people up to no good to hide. I kind of look at it this way. Think about any of those movies you've seen where the guy's riding through this little ravine. Maybe he's walking and all of a sudden the camera angles are going from all these different places, and you just know there's somebody peeking at them. You're like, okay, somebody's going to jump. And then, boom, he jumps out, and they rob him. Okay, that's exactly what kind of happened here. Maybe, maybe not the ravine, but that's how I see it. Let's look at verse 31. 31 and 32 says, A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. So the priest, the priest was someone who oversaw and administered sacrifices in the temple and maintained the temple. And, and someone, someone who was in need and saw the priest coming, that was a good thing. They were excited because surely this man who serves God would help someone in need. But that's not what happened. This priest crossed over to the other side and kept on going. And then next came the Levite. Now, he was the one who assisted the priest in the temple. A lot of the duties, uh, like singing duties and cleaning duties and all kinds of duties came. Uh, the Levite did that. Thank you. Thank you. That was a movie reference. Most of, most of what I said about the priest goes for the Levite. Okay? He, he crossed on the other side and he didn't react the same way. But it would be a good omen for him to come by. I love this. It's no coincidence that Jesus mentioned these two offices. Because many times in the Old Testament, three offices were mentioned when it came to religious acts. You had the priest, you had the Levite, and you had the people, the Israel people, referred to as one, the people. Now Jesus is talking in front of these people, the Israelites, the Jews, the audience would have connected the dots. They'd have been like, okay, there's number one. Uh-huh, there's number two. So they knew the next person come along was a Jew. It's just obvious. It's one, two, three. That's just how they tell stories. Now let's, let's talk for a second about the motives of the priest and the Levite. And what I mean by that is we can't talk about their motives. I've, heard, I've read a lot of speculation this week, but there's nothing in the text to say why they crossed to the other side. So any speculation would be wrong, or at least it would be a waste of time to speculate. So we're not going to spend time on this because Jesus' point is that neither man loved their neighbor. That's the whole point that he uses for this. Here we go. Let's go to 33 and 35, through 35. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Here's the plot twist. Remember I said that the expectation was that Jesus would include that third group. It would be a Jew. 
but it wasn't. It was a Samaritan. Now, first, to totally grasp the weight of this, we have to understand who the Samaritans were and the relationships between the Samaritans and the Jews. So let me ask this. Do we have any Wildcat fans in the house? University of Arizona, not Kentucky. Why? Okay, all right, cool. So, so I think you can maybe see that the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans are kind of like the Wildcats and the scum, I mean, Sun Devils. Okay? It's kind of like that, but on steroids. Let me give you some history. We're going to go all the way back, all the way back to the days of the first kings of Israel. So during the reigns of King Saul, King David, and King Solomon, there was one united kingdom of Israel. Then after Solomon's death, the kingdom was divided. There was the southern kingdom that had Jerusalem, and it was often called Judah. And then there was the northern kingdom. Samaria was its capital, and sometimes it was referred to as the kingdom of Samaria. Now, in 722 B.C., Samaria fell to the Assyrian Empire. It was the first one to fall. The Jews there were either exiled throughout and sent throughout the Assyrian Empire, or they stayed there. If they stayed there, they intermarried with non-Jews. So, in the eyes of the remaining Israelites in the southern kingdom, the Samaritans were half-breeds because they were not pure Jewish blood. They were looked down on and even referred to as dogs. Then after the Jews returned from their exile, the Jews, same thing, excuse me, Jerusalem, the, lower, the, the southern kingdom, was exiled. When they came back from Babylon, they started to rebuild the temple. And the Samaritans were like, hey, hey, we're here. We have the same line. We want to help. And they said, nah, get out of here. You're, you're half-breeds. You're dogs. We don't want anything to do with you. Leave. They were rejected. So they went and they built their own temple, which later in 128 B.C., the Jews destroyed. So you can see the hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans was legendary. And when the Jews needed to travel north, when they had to go from Jerusalem area up, they would go as far as they had to out of their way so they would not come in contact with any Samaritans. That's, that's, that's a hate. That's a deep-rooted hate. So to have a Samaritan help this man was crazy. From what we know, he was not given any other signs that the other that the others didn't have. It's not that the guy looked up at him. The story doesn't say anything like that. He had all the same information when he approached. But yet, instead of going around, he crossed over to the other side, approached the man, helped him with his wounds. And in doing so, he made himself susceptible to the same robbers, the same danger that this man encountered. And why does he do all this? It says in the text, because he had compassion. He was moved with compassion. And why is this the ultimate plot twist? Because see, the audience thinks, oh yeah, man, the priest passed by, the Levite passed by. Here comes a Samaritan. This guy's doomed. There's no way the Samaritan's going to help him. And what? Ironically, Jesus makes the Samaritan the most hated group of people, makes him the hero of the story. He treats the man's rooms, puts him on his vehicle, his animal, walks him to an end, then pays the innkeeper to take care of him and says, I'll be back to do more. And the two denarii that he gave, that's equivalent to a full day's wage. So let's say you're making minimum wage in Arizona right now. Okay, two days, that's about $200. If you're making double minimum wage, $400 to help a stranger. It probably paid for about two months of the stay, but the man says, if you have to, if you, if you get any more costs, if you incur any more costs, I'll come back and I'll pay those. So the most unlikely of helpers saves the man's life. Let's look at verse 36. Jesus is talking. He says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now, again, in verse 29, the expert asks, who is my neighbor? I want you to understand that in the Greek, how he uses the word neighbor, he uses it as a noun, which in this context, it conveys a burdensome duty 
that is owed to something or someone. This is exactly what the expert is trying to weasel out of. He doesn't want to have to do something. But the way Jesus uses the word is a verb. He describes a way of behaving towards other people, other people in need. And this behavior comes with both benefits for both the giver and the receiver. Let's look at verse 37. The one who showed him mercy, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. The expert of law has no choice but to give the obvious answer. But look how he cannot bring himself to say the Samaritan. See, this shows that he has some difficulty with the story's outcome, with accepting the full ramifications of what Jesus is trying to teach. But we'll give him a little credit because he does acknowledge what the Samaritan did. He showed mercy. And then Jesus tells him, this is what you need to do too. So we're going to go into application time. I'm doing a little bit different today than we've been doing. So we broke down the the passage, and now we're going to do three points of application. So here's our first one is, how are we saved? So if you look in your bulletin, you've got some lines. If anything I say jots, uh, you know, connects with you, just write it down. How are we saved? We're going to follow the line of the story. The expert of law asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Now, the way this was originally written in Greek shows that he was thinking of a works-based salvation. He wanted a rule or a set of rules to live by so he could go to heaven. You know what this is called? It's called legalism. Depending on a law or a rule instead of faith in God, instead of following God. Now, if we take the scripture that this man uses, if we take it at face value, we could see how he would see it that way. Oh, I just have to love some people and I'll get into heaven. But here's the problem with that. It's not the action of loving your neighbor that saves you. The action of love is actually, it's our response to God's love for us. And if we truly love God the way Jesus speaks of love, then we rely on God and not ourselves and not rules. Jesus' reasoning for this story is to bring an end to legalism. And one of his points is to live a life of love means living a life of the kingdom of God. I like how it says in 1 John 4, 20 to 21. It puts up on the screen. It should be in your, yeah, it's up on the screen. 1 John 4, 20 and 21, it says, If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. How do you love, how do you not love someone you've seen And then say you love someone that you have not seen. Jesus knows that legalism ran rampant back in that time. People were looking for a quick fix to get into heaven. But with Jesus' life and death, a new way of salvation is about to be ushered in. And I think you can agree that times aren't that different now from then. People are still looking for a quick fix. There, There are many out there, maybe even some in here that think, if I'm a good enough person, if I do the right things, if I'm nice to people now and then, maybe show a little love, maybe I give some money to charity, that I'll get into heaven. Their drive is for the thing that they're doing, and they rest on that getting them into heaven. When people do this, they miss the whole point of the gospel. It's not a life about rules. It's not about things that we have to do. Now, yes, the Bible is full of guidelines, but these are not the focus. The focus is having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. 
because of what he did on the cross, we have direct access to God and eternal life. See, if you haven't heard the story, Jesus, God's son, he came to earth as a baby, what we're celebrating at this time of year. He lived a perfect, sinless life that only he could do. He loved everyone that he came in contact with, and he taught others to do the same. And then when the time came, he suffered, he bled, he took our sins upon himself, and he died a gruesome death so that we don't have to. Then he rose three days later, proving that Christ had the power to overcome death and sin, proving that he was God. This is what Jesus did so that we can have our sins forgiven and have eternal life. And there is one thing that you have to do. You have to make a decision. You have to choose God. You have to believe in Jesus and repent from your sins. You have to say, you have to say God, I know I'm a sinner, and I want to turn from my sins and turn to you. And I, God, I believe that you are the creator of the universe, and I believe that Jesus was your son, that he died for me, and I want to follow you for the rest of my life to the best of my ability. And that's it. Keeping rules doesn't get you into heaven. Believing in Jesus, making that one choice does. And then from then on, you live a life driven by your love for God. Yes, God wants us to change he wants it to be less like the world and more like Jesus. But there are two things you can't miss here. Listen, just being like Jesus alone will not get you into heaven. That's works-based, trying to be a good person. No, we, we have to repent and believe. And the second thing is, any action of change in us is fueled by our love for God. It's not out of fear. It's not out of promise of a reward. It is, our, it is our reaction to God's saving grace and mercy. Once we are his, our lives should be devoted to following him the best we can. And that's the point of the story. We must have a life built on the love for God, not on works. Now we have to talk about this, okay? If you don't recall a time in your life when you did this, when you made that choice, repent and believe, you probably aren't saved. Now, hear me. I'm, I'm not saying you have to remember the date, the hour, what you were wearing. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if, if, if you don't remember making a decision, if you, don't, if you don't recollect it at all, then you have to ask, am I saved? See, the idea of where you were and how old you are, those kind of things, they stick in your mind. I remember talking to a woman one time and, and, I was, and, and I was asking her her salvation story and she's like, I've always known God. I've always been a child of God. I'm like, well, did you ever do this? And she's like, I can remember being one years old and riding around on my bike and just going, I'm a child of God. And trying to explain to her that you have to make a decision. She couldn't grasp it. So you need to know that you have to make that decision. If you can't remember it, are you sure that it's happened? I can picture where I was. I was 12 years old. I was in my pastor's house in Clewiston, Florida. He told me a story using a quarter. I don't remember what the story was, but I was 12 and he let me keep the quarter, so that was cool. I know that he made sure I understood everything before I made a decision, and I made that decision that night in his living room. Next week I went forward at church, and a little while later I was baptized. I can't tell you the exact dates, but I know what happened and I know where and when I was. So are you able to say that? And if you aren't, I want to invite you to say it today. I want to invite you to make a decision today. In just a few minutes, you'll have an opportunity to respond to God. But let's go to point two. Now that we understand the how, let's talk about the who. Who's your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? In this Luke passage, the expert is hoping his neighbor is only the ones he wants to love. But then he realized that Jesus might be alluding to more of that. So he wanted to know, what exactly does Jesus mean? And Jesus, like he always does, he turned their thinking upside down. He said, the way you're thinking isn't the way it is. Jesus showed the man, and he shows us that our neighbor is every person other than ourselves. 
Every single one of you in here is my neighbor. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your color, your shape, your size, your social status. It doesn't matter your level of wealth, your living conditions, where you love, what college you went to. It doesn't matter because when Jesus says love your neighbor, he means everyone. We're going to move quickly. Now that we understand that, let's talk about this. Do you love your neighbor? You know who your neighbor is. Do you love your neighbor? Jesus shows that one doesn't have a neighbor. One is a neighbor. He says it's not about just having a neighbor. You need to be a neighbor. We should all be striving to become a neighbor to everyone around us. This is not, this is not the call to solve all the world's problems, okay? I'm not saying you have to be everything for everyone. But it is a heart condition and a choice to love and to help those who are in need that you are able to help, no matter who they are. If you can help them, if you can be their neighbor, we are called to do that. And we do that because we're sharing God's love. And if, and if we ask the question, how, how do we love them? The right answer is right here in the text. You love your neighbor as yourself. Put yourself in their shoes. What would you want? What would you need if you were them? How would you want someone to help you? And a little side note, if you don't take care of yourself and your own health, you can't take care of others. So you have to be healthy to be a help to others. And the last thing here, we know Jesus wants us to live this way because of how he ends the story. What does he say? Go and do likewise. That is his command. This is how you should live, so go and do it. If we truly love God and seek him, then we'll make the choices to follow Jesus. He'll lead us to love others. Our love for others comes out of the love for Jesus. So now what? Here's our wrap-up. Now what? Two questions. Do you really love God? Do you really love God? God. And the second one, are you allowing him to move you from who you are to who he wants you to be? He wants you to love your neighbor. He wants to show love. He wants you to show love to everyone around you. But this does not come naturally as humans. So we must ask him to make us into who he wants us to be. And understand this. We celebrate people who make decisions to follow Christ. We cheer, we are excited when they accept Jesus because we know they just made a huge life change in the right direction that will give them more than they've ever had. But church, this is not the finish line. This is the starting line. This is just the beginning. That, that life change is just the beginning. And if we give them a pat on the back and we say, welcome to the club, and then we send them on their way and we leave... We are setting themselves up to fail. We are hurting them. And since this is just the starting line, they need people to walk through life with them. They need people to show them what to do in different situations, how to respond, how God would want them to respond in those acts, how it's different from how they did without Christ. We need to teach them the Bible and help them understand it because they are young and they don't get it. And if we aren't, what are these things called, by the way? This is called discipleship. We are discipling people through this. This is what Jesus did with his disciples. And if we aren't doing this, if we aren't encouraging them to be a part of this, we're hurting them. And now I'm going to turn it and talk to you, new Christians, young Christians, maybe even Christians of many years that have not truly jumped in all the way. You need to reach out. You need to put the effort in you need to come to Bible study on Sunday morning, the one after the service. Pick one. You need to come on Wednesday nights. There, is, there are teachers that help unpack and help you understand scriptures that you might not otherwise get. Find someone that will pour into you, that will disciple you, that will answer any questions you have, that will help you understand what God expects from you in your new life. And if you don't do this, you are going to fail. The Christian life is about always moving forward, always moving closer to who God wants you to be. And you know what? It's never done 
I don't care how long you've been a Christian or how old you are, you're not done growing. I love how Pastor Craig Rochelle says it. He says, if you're not dead, you're not done. Some people think that they can check out because they've arrived, and it's not like that. So keep moving, keep serving, keep growing, and keep leading others to do the same. So as we enter into our response time, I'm going to give you three suggestions on how to respond. First one is, if you realize today that you have not made that choice, that you cannot recall when and where or if it even happened, I invite you today to do it. If you are ready to make that choice, if you want to make that choice, don't leave today without making that choice. And please, if you do make it, you can either come up and talk to Brian and I. Now you can do it after the service, or you can just pull out one of those cards, write it on that one of those cards, and hand it to one of the ushers as you're walking out. But don't leave today without being sure, without being able to answer how and if you're getting eternal life. The second way I suggest you to do it is, is if you were going through here and you realize, you know what, I'm not following God to the way he wants. I'm not loving my neighbor as I should be. I didn't even realize who my neighbor was. I thought it was the person next door to me. If you have a change, if God is working on your heart, I, I want you to simply listen to him and say, God, here's what I'm willing to do. And ask him, please help me to move from where I am to where you want me to be. And the last one is, is if, you, if you feel like, you know what, I've, I'm, I'm there, I've done those things, I'm loving my neighbor, I'm, I'm giving, I'm doing all the things I need to do, then I have a question, are you discipling someone? Are you teaching someone to do what you're doing? Are you bringing them along and helping them to see? I have seen in the church that sometimes there's a generational gap because the generation before has not spent the time with the generation after. Let's not be that church. Let's build people up. Let's teach them how to walk. So as, as the band comes in a moment, I'm going to pray, and I just want to invite you to, to respond to God however he is leading you. Please stand with me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. Again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom and knowledge that we get from that. And God, I pray that today some of that wisdom and knowledge you imparted on us was received well. And I pray right now in these moments, Lord, there are people in here that are hearing, they have heard what you have said and they want to respond. They're feeling pushed, God, but they're, they're fighting it. God, I pray that you will break down those barriers. Lord, help them to hear you clearly and please lead them to whatever change you're wanting them to make. God, we know that we've never arrived, we'll never completely be perfect, God, but we want to be as close to you as possible. We want to please you because we love you, God. So I pray that you will stir hearts right now in this moment. Help people not to be afraid, not to ignore you because it's too hard. God, move us from where we are to you, where you want us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.